Now on today, to today's panel, uh, entitled Illinois Public Pension Reform, Who's Gonna Pay? Uh, as, as you no doubt, if you're here, you know this is an important topic, both for Illinois residents, but also nationally, because uh, unfortunately this isn't a unique problem to Illinois. Uh, tonight's distinguished panel of, uh, is gonna discuss the causes of the pension problem and uh, the, some of the uh, political intractability uh, that's taken place to date, and hopefully we'll get some updates from some of our elected officials as to what's going on. Um, and let me introduce uh, our panel. Uh, first to my right is Professor Anne Lucine. She's a native of Chicago uh, who, has a, who was a research assistant at the 6th Illinois Constitutional Convention in Springfield in 1970. Uh, after that, she was a staff assistant to the Speaker of the Illinois House of representatives from 1971 to 1975, and she spent two years as the par parliamentarian of the House. Since 1975, she's taught here at John Marshall and held several governmental and civic positions. Uh, her book, The Illinois State Constitution, a reference guide, uh, was published in 2009 and is essential reading for uh, the topic. And Next year, 2013 to 2014 academic year, she's gonna be the Edward T. and Noble W. Lee Chair in Constitutional Law. She, uh, tonight she's being very gracious in offering her time. She is teaching a Const Illinois Constitution class uh, at 6.30. Yeah. And so she's gonna speak first, take some questions, and then unfortunately she's gonna to have to slip out. Um, uh, so let me, uh, let me hand the floor to Professor Lucine, and then I'll introduce our other panels. Thank you very much. Uh, I've been asked to speak on the Illinois constitutional provision, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on. The so-called public pension clause of the Illinois Constitution is Article 13, Section 5, and reads, pension and retirement rights, membership in any pension or retirement system of the state, any unit of local government or school district, or any agency or instrumentality thereof, shall be an enforceable contractual relationship, the benefits of which shall not be diminished or impaired. How did it get there? Well, let's go back a few years. Up until about the 1930s, pensions, whether public or private, for employees of for-profit entities or not-for-profit entities, anything, were relatively rare. Then came the Social Security Act of 1936, which applied to private businesses. For that historical reason, that is why many public employees in the United States, perhaps most, are not on Social Security and Medicare. During the Great Depression, many school teachers and other public employees were paid in scrip, which is a kind of promissory note. Many were in over their heads. In 1938, New York adopted a constitutional amendment that is substantially the same as the one we have in Illinois. It was the first public pension guarantee in a state constitution. It promised these public employees that when they got old, they would still have pensions. Since then, about six states have adopted similar provisions and a couple more have adopted the substance of the clause by case law. The purpose of these clauses is to give participants in public pension systems a cause of action, a claim against a government for an old age pension. Without the ability to bring such a claim, there is really no way that the pensioner can obtain the money. That is because, historically speaking, there is no way that there, a court will issue a writ of mandamus to compel a legislative body to perform a discretionary legislative act, such as raising taxes or appropriating funds for a purpose. Without such a constitutional guarantee, say most observers, the pensioner could not even get a judgment in a court of claims. If you want to read an incredibly thorough analysis of the history, both nationally and in Illinois, read Eric Medeer's article on the website of the Illinois State Senate. He is the legal counsel to the president of the Senate. Here in Illinois, we used to have 
bipartisan, bicameral legislative commissions that were responsible for studying a large problem and making recommendations to both the legislature and the governor. From 1940 until sometime in the 1980s, we had the Illinois Pension Laws Commission, which for many years was chaired by State Representative Noble W. Lee, the dean of the John Marshall Law School. If you want to know about the early history of public pensions in Illinois, you should read the annual reports of that commission. Between 1940 and 1970, the reports show that the Illinois public pensions, state and local, were 40% funded most of the time. I have always asked what that percentage meant because I know that everybody talks about the level of funding and the experts say that the optimum level of funding is, quote, 80%, close quote. As best I can determine, the usual definition is that this is the amount that would be needed if all of the employees who are eligible for retirement retired all at once. When I have asked the experts if that could ever happen, that is, absolutely everybody eligible would retire at once, they say, of course it wouldn't happen. <clears throat> the real figure we should be looking at is how much money it will take to pay the retirement pensions of public employees if they retire and take pensions at the rate we estimate they will retire and if they live for the number of years that we estimate they will live, thereby taking so much money out of the pension system. Sometimes pension experts say to me, yes, that's the best way to do it, but we don't do it that way. What can I say? I have no doubt that we might discover that Illinois is just barely scraping together enough money each year to be able to pay the current pension obligations that way. But at least we'd have a more reasonable analysis. Are you listening, Standard and Poor's? Okay? There is case law in Illinois suggesting that if and when the day comes that a participant in a public pension system can show to a court that he or she is not receiving a pension owed him or her, or that the pension fund is on the brink of insolvency, then that person can bring a suit in court claiming that the government in question must be ordered to pay that pension participant. We may be on the cusp of that. If you want to know how Article 13, Section 5 arose at the Constitutional Convention, look at the debates for July 21st, 1970. Delegate Henry Green of the Champaign-Urbana area introduced the provision in exactly the wording it has now. The proponents pointed out that public employees were at the mercy of the governing boards of their employers. They were, there were employees, notably police officers and firefighters, who came to the convention and pointed out that their boards would say, we know we are statutorily required to put our share into your pension funds, but we need the money for some other things, so we won't do it. These police officers and firefighters and I won't even mention the teachers and the state employees, you can guess what they thought, were afraid that they were putting in their employee share, but that the governments were putting in their employer share, and that the rate of return on the invested amounts wouldn't yield enough to pay their pensions when they retired. Remember that those two groups tend to retire at a younger age than most because they are effectively going on disability due to injuries received in their dangerous jobs. If you read through the debates, you see two things. First, there was a consensus that the public employee pensions were regularly and seriously underfunded and that it was a growing problem. Second, there was an understanding that the language of the amendment was very strong and would allow the legislature very little leeway indeed to change the public pensions once the employee's interest had vested. The debate, the difference of opinion, 
was over whether this provision really belonged in a constitution or whether it should be left to the legislature. The opponents did not deny that there was a serious problem. They just thought that the language was so strong that it would deprive the legislature of some latitude or wiggle room it might need. The vote was 57 ayes, 36 nays, with six voting pass and three voting present. Uh, I think there were about, from my count, about 16 delegates who didn't record anything, neither an aye nor a nay, nor a past, nor a present. So quite overwhelmingly, the, uh, if you look at the eyes and the nays, and in fact what they said, you see that there was a consensus, there's a problem here. The, uh, the issue was whether this should be left to the legislature or put into a constitutional provision. So there we have it. I won't go through the case law or the various bills proposed in recent years. It suffices to say that over the years, some of the funds have not been managed well, although one or two have impressive rates of return. In at least one case, the governing board was appallingly corrupt, as a federal trial showed. Let me suggest a few things we could do or should do here in Illinois. There has been an absence of good leadership and an absence of good followership on this issue. Our leaders don't ask us, the people, to make sacrifices, and we, the people, say we don't want to make sacrifices. This has to change. First, let's get real. As I suggested earlier, we need to look at the real numbers. Second, let's look at who is suggesting what and why. Now, Everybody says, well, it's the unions versus the governments versus the what, you know. Obviously, I know where the public employees are coming from and where the public employee unions are coming from, but I have been wondering why the public pension issue came to the fore in about 2008 and not before. Was it just the Great Recession? Well, partly yes, because the rates of return on all investments plummeted. But some securities lawyers have told me that another reason is the desire of large investment houses, Wall Street, if you will, to break the power of the public pension funds as investors. These funds, they tell me, are the investors who question directors' judgment, who bring shareholders derivative suits, etc. Think about the recent state developments regarding public employee unions in, say, Wisconsin, and the passage of a right to work law in Michigan and ask what's really going on, who really wants what and why. I think we have to do that all the way through all of our debates anywhere in this country. And then let's separate out those issues from the real issue of public pension reform. What would I suggest as a concrete idea? Well, first of all, repeal the exemption of all pensions from the state income tax. At the moment, all pensions in Illinois, public, private, social security, you name it, are all exempt from the state income tax. That's been true since the 1980s, period. It was a terrible idea in the 1980s, in my opinion, and it is now costing Illinois millions, perhaps up to a billion dollars in lost revenues. Now, for the rest of my suggestions, uh, see the articles that I passed out, which are columns of mine in the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin. Okay, are there any questions? Because I do indeed have to leave uh, to go to my class, okay? Yes? Um, I read last year that a, um, a law, for a prestigious law firm, I can't remember which one here in Chicago, wrote some sort of white paper that said Illinois might have to declare bankruptcy if they declared, if the state declared bankruptcy, then the pension laws would not have to be obeyed. A state cannot declare bankruptcy, period. Bankruptcy has to be declared to the Bankruptcy Reform Act of 1979 as amended, a congressional act. 
The only thing that would reasonably be relevant would be Chapter 9, which applies to certain local governments only in certain states. The sovereign states, all 50 of them, cannot and have not ever been able to declare bankruptcy. Uh, I checked it out, and in Illinois... It Illin might have been insolvency. It was a, a technical term. I think I'm using insolvency term. means the inability to pay one's bills as they become due, current bills as they become due, which, you know, to a certain extent we're in, but bankruptcy is a special term. And uh, in Illinois, local governments cannot declare bankruptcy. You know, local governments, in effect, can only do what the uh, state allows them to do, and the state government of Illinois does not allow local governments to declare bankruptcy. California does, a few other states do, but uh, Illinois does not. Decla and, you know, the interesting thing is, every now and then, I get somebody saying it would be a great idea, you know, they could declare bankruptcy. I say, you know how bankruptcy works? I mean, I used to teach this until they moved me to another course. I said, look, <laughs> I'll tell you, what happens is you got a federal judge, a federal bankruptcy judge, who then sits down with the creditors. I said, lovely. Some federal bankruptcy judge in Springfield is going to get his 15 minutes of fame, right? Because he's running the bankruptcy of Illinois. And, you know, in our federal system, the theory is sovereign states cannot uh, declare bankruptcy. And frankly, I don't see that changing, especially since the professor at the University of Pennsylvania who came up with that idea once admitted that under the normal bankruptcy laws, all of the bondholders would come in after the pension holders, and that's not what the bondholders want. And guess who's behind a lot of this? The bondholders, right? Okay. Is that Sharon Alter back yes, there? Yes. yes. Yeah. And is there a connection between that argument that you have and the very activist role since 2008 of the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club of Chicago, um, the Illinois Broke Movement? Oh, I have nothing to do with the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club of no, Chicago. I, I mean, do. I can't I comment on that. I am telling you what some securities lawyers have told me. And one of them said to me, what do you know about the Securities Reform Act of 1998? And I said, simply put, nothing. And he said, that is a, a real key here. This is somebody on the East Coast, and I saw at a business lawyer's meeting. And he said, uh, and he went through how you bring share, how the changes in bringing shareholders' derivative suits occurred in 1998. And he, he said, and I'm giving you, this is in quotations, all right? I'm, I'm not a securities lawyer, and I don't bring derivative suits. He said, if you look at that, you'll see that who, the biggest shareholders are the only ones who can bring these suits. And he said, you can be quite certain the mutual funds, which are big investors, aren't going to do it because they're really part of the Wall Street group in any of it. So then you got some private pension funds like the one I've been under for years, TIA CREF, they generally wouldn't, although maybe they would. And he said the ones that are really quite active are the public pension funds. And he mentioned a word I bet you've heard, CalPERS, right? Now, I, I don't have the time and the energy to go looking up CalPERS and seeing how many suits they've been bringing, but he mentioned that. And then all of a sudden I noticed something. I'm getting emails from prof a professor at Harvard who runs a corporate institute on corporate governance. And he says he, a, want, and he wants me to take his reports and sign up to get his reports. I got enough to read. <laughs> and he said, and he said I, br I am bringing this to try to get some information on how better corporations could be run. And I do this on behalf of, and he listed the following six or eight uh, public uh, employee pen, uh, public employee unions and pension funds. And they were California and a couple actually here in Illinois, I think. 
And I thought, isn't that interesting? You know, I tied that in with what I'd heard before. And beyond that, you know, uh, you got to go ask a securities lawyer, okay? Anybody here a securities lawyer? Anybody here bring shareholders derivative and liability suits? Not you, Ken. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. I thought I was, yes. Well, it technically attaches at vesting, and uh, then there, and in the depending on the fund, it's whenever you vest, and right. Well, I, when I do think, you vest? I think, I think it, it applies the moment you start putting money into the fund. It, it, you, you know, whatever you put in, you, you're entitled to get back. Vesting gives you certain rights yeah. going forward, but uh, the way it's written, I think the first day you make a payment to the pension fund. When do you, you know, I can't remember. When I was part of SERS years ago, State Employees Retirement System, I can't remember when I started putting it in, but it was not right away. And I started getting something about uh, a, a little note saying you vested, and I, I'm not sure exactly when the two came together. Uh, by the way, I, oh, a terrific disclaimer here. When I left paid positions in state government at the age of 40, I, being brilliant, took out all of my pension fund contributions and took a vacation in Italy. <laughs> so I do not have any skin in this game. I will never get a public pension, okay? And I can't sue and I can't do anything else. Uh, when is it the judge's vest? I think it's when they take a and they start paying in. It's when they raise their hand and get take their oath of office, and it varies from but, but from group to. Remember, the judges are under yet a different. That's the, the different constitution, in terms of diminishment of their salary. salary. Well, see, I have told some people salary is one thing, but the pensions is another. I do get calls from people who say, "Well, what if they start uh, rearranging uh, the uh, medical system, the medical benefit?" I said. Medical benefits are not part of the pension. They're not part of the pension clause. And, you know, they're not happy to hear that. I said, listen, you ask my opinion. I mean, you know, Larry can tell you, if you don't want to hear my opinion, don't ask it, right? <laughs> uh, and the other one is I get a few people saying, how dare you want to tax pensions? I mean, that diminishes my net income. I say, sure, me too. I get Social Security. Of course, yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, how would that muddy the waters, or would it muddy the waters? I do have skin in the game, so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, if you look at one of my articles uh, that was passed out, one of my columns, uh, the law bulletin <laughs> gave it the title, Professor Gives This Amendment an F. And it, the amendment that you're referring to uh, was voted on last year. Uh, November and voted down, I thought was really quite dreadful. Uh, I can't really comment on each of the various bills that have been put in. There have been so many of them, I've gotten confused. I, I, get, I, I used to read bills for a living, but now I stop at 200 pages. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Well, if I could maybe ask a question that I think is similar to the question you were just asked. Suppose one were to by virtue, but by the ordinary channels, simply repeal Article 13, Section 5 of the Constitution. What would the impact of such an act be on the rights of current members who were once covered by the provision? Then the only thing they would have would be the provision in the Bill of Rights which declares there can be no impairment of contracts. Uh, a provision which is identical to one in the United States Constitution, although not in the United States Constitution's Bill of Rights. There have been a couple of states which by case law have said that those provisions, no impairment of contracts, uh, will prevent any uh, diminishment of contracts uh, rights 
already accrued by people who were already in them. Now, I do not know if that would be the general view held here in Illinois through our case law. We have very little case law that I have seen on impairment of contracts, so I don't know. Well, would there be a difference between the class of employees once covered by the now repeal article and the class of new employees who were never members? Yeah, presumably, yes. But if you've got a whole bunch of new employees getting ready to come in, and you say to them, you will have no there is no Article 13, Section 5, uh, then you've got an interesting question as to whether you in any way have made a contractual arrangement with them. Uh, the interesting thing is Social Security. Give them credit for a lot of brains in the 1930s. They came in and said, in the Social Security Act, this is not a contractual relationship. We can raise and diminish the benefits as we of the Social Security Administration and Congress see fit to do. Did you know that? Isn't it nifty? I cash my check every month. But yeah, that's, so that's what they did with Social Security, you know. Anybody else? Nothing? I'm sure you want to hear these gentlemen. Yes, go ahead. Just one last question about other states. Um, is it customary for pension benefits to be in statute, or are they arrived at in other mechanisms, for instance, negotiation in other states? I really don't know, but there certainly are statutes covering this in almost all states. What they say would vary from state to state. I once had an assistant do a study of this, and there was a great deal of a, a change. Um, you know, some states don't have a lot of public employee unions. I'm old enough to remember the days when you really didn't have teachers unions and they couldn't negotiate anything there for. And, that, and the policemen, uh, <coughs> Commissioner Sufferden and I remember the days when Mayor Daley, Richard J. Daley, said, I do everything on a handshake. Remember, with the policemen and the firemen and the teachers, everything was done on a handshake, right? That's right. Yeah, those days are gone, <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, this is sort of a segue into the next segment of today's program, but uh, can you speak a little bit about what the political will is that make any kind of reform in the pension system given Article uh, 13, uh, 13, Section 5? Well, I have worked so closely with legislators over the years and worked for them for four years, years ago. I know what a tough job it is, but by God, somebody's got to stand up and say, look, it was a mistake in the 1980s to take pensions out of the income tax and we should put it right back in again. Now who's going to, when you talk about political will, let me ask you this, what would you all do if your candidate for the state legislature stood up and said, I want to put pensions back in under the state income tax, including Social Security. What would you all say? Yes. Well, no. What do you think most of your uh, uh, other people in the constituency would say? No. Yes. no. I mean, they count the votes, right? I conclude with a wonderful little line from Edmund Burke. You all know it, don't you? Uh, it's addressed to the electors of Bristol. Senator, you know it, don't you? Uh, my uh, opponent has said that uh, if elected, he will represent your wishes completely in the House of Commons. I believe that a representative of the people owes them his, his judgment as well as his industry and his integrity and he is elected to exercise his judgment rather than make himself a slave to their wishes. Isn't that lovely? Isn't that wonderful? And I've heard he lost the election. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, uh, for taking the time tonight, uh, making your class run late. I next want to introduce our two elected officials who are here, are going to be taking a nice shot while I introduce them. The first is uh, uh, Senator Daniel Biss, who's on the far left. Uh, 
Senator Biss has a PhD in math from MIT. Uh, he was elected to the Illinois House of Representatives in 2010, and two years later he was elected to become the Illinois Senate Senator from the 9th District. Uh, he serves as a co-chair of a bar bipartisan working group to explore solutions in the pension crisis. Uh, he's co-sponsored several bills that he's going to talk about today. Uh, and before I introduce him up to the dais, I'm going to also introduce uh, Larry Sufferden, who's here. Uh, Larry is a, a current Cook County Commissioner for the 13th District since 2002. He's been on the Legislative Council uh, for, of the Chicago Bar Association for 30 years. Uh, he serves as the Chairman of the Board of Legislation and Intergovernmental Committee, uh, and also serves on the Pension Subcommittee, uh, importantly, for today. And uh, he graduated from Loyola uh, here in Chicago and has a law degree from Georgetown. Um, and he's a partner at Chesky and Pro. Uh, let me introduce uh, Senator Biss. And then uh, hopefully we'll, after this, we'll just uh, open it up for questions after uh, uh, Commissioner Shufferdin uh, speaks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not much of a sitter, but I just, I, there's the, these pillars. and. Is it OK if I? Is, yeah. uh, all right. We have to share the microphone, so. Oh. Um, how's that? Good. Great. Um, so th thank you for um, this invitation. I, I'm going to try to not use up all of my time with jokes about how I'm not a lawyer, but it's, <laughs> it's unbelievably Tempting, granted, how preposterously um, alone I feel in that in that respect. I bought this book about the LSAT one time, and it, that was the end of my legal career, actually. Um, so I'll just say a few things, and um, and then we can, I think, spend the bulk of our time on questions. But but what I, I want to talk about right now is three things quickly. Uh, and I'll do the awful thing of actually giving you the table of contents so you know when not to pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, first, I'll say what I think are the existing interpretations of Article 13, Section 5 of the Constitution. Uh, then I'll say something about one of them. Then I'll say something about Springfield. So. Um, Professor Lucine laid out what I think is the conventional, or what one might call the naive, or let's be honest, the plain language interpretation of Article 13, Section 5. Membership is a contractual benefit. Uh, and actually, if I, if I may um, presume to, to um, make some change, recommend some changes to her, her um, characterization, um, Vesting is something, it's a technical thing that takes place vis-a-vis -vis your relationship to the pension system a certain number of years after you come in. But you begin paying as soon as, your, your payment to the pension system is deducted from your first paycheck. Uh, and that contractual right, I believe, is, be, is viewed by most people to commence upon employment, or at the very latest, upon the first time you get a paycheck from which a contribution into the retirement system is deducted. And you don't need a mathematician to tell a room full of attorneys, and with a sprinkling of future attorneys, that a contractual relationship has a fairly agnostic assessment of the question of whether benefits are prospective or retrospective. So the, the, the conventional and what I think was historically the consensus view on this point was that the formula is the formula. By virtue of being an employee, you're guaranteed to that formula uh, until death. Um, so if the statute says you can retire at a certain age, you can. And that may not be changed unilaterally. If the statute says uh, your employee contribution is a certain percentage of your salary, it is. And that may not be changed unilaterally. And if the formula says, here's what you get upon your first year after retirement, that's what it is, and it cannot be changed unilaterally. And if the formula says that increases annually based upon a certain formula subsequent to retirement, that's what it is, and it cannot be changed unilaterally. That's the conventional um, 
interpretation of the pension clause, which these days in the press gets referred to as the union interpretation, but, but I think it's fair to, to say that it was the everybody interpretation as little as certainly 10 years ago, but even really five years ago. Okay, so that's, that's one interpretation. Another interpretation which was advanced by, for instance, the, instance, the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club was that whatever you may think a contract is, let's not be crazy. We all know that, of course, it doesn't make any sense to lock the state into a particular type of benefit one day after you've been employed, possibly at the age of 22, possibly 70 years before you're likely to, to pass on. Of course, this could only possibly refer to benefits earned to date. And as someone who's not an attorney, I'll say that I, one could easily conjure up some sympathy for the point that this is trying to make, but as a legal argument, it seems to have seems to me to have very little force. I don't, I don't understand what about the plain language of Article 13, Section 5 might make, even by implication, reference to be benefits earned to date as opposed to the formula that makes up the, in, the contractual relationship to, described in the, in the Constitution. So that's the second uh, point, uh, the second interpretation that one sometimes hears. The third interpretation that one sometimes hears is something that goes something like this. Um, the systems are in terrible shape, the state's in terrible shape, the actuaries look at us and say, dude, you're not possibly going to make the payments you have to make. These systems are going to go bust at some point. Uh, the executive director of the teacher's retirement system has said in testimony before the Illinois House on at least one occasion that in his view the benefit is currently impaired. So the benefit the, the relationship, the benefits of which shall not be diminished or impaired, has already, he claimed, been impaired by virtue of the fact that no reasonable person could assume that all the benefits will be paid based upon an actuarial analysis of the, the status quo today, along with an assessment of the behavior of the Illinois legislature over the course of the last few decades. So goes this argument. The benefit has already been impaired, so a set of changes that actually shores up the system and ensures the benefit will be there could be viewed, and I, I will gladly agree this is kind of a slimy thing to say, but could be viewed not as a diminishment at all, but rather as an enhancement, because they make the benefit clearly something that's going to be there. So that's an argument that you hear sometimes. Um, and the last argument that you hear sometimes is simply all protections, whether they're constitutional or statutory or ethical, are simply demand that they be balanced against one another. They're all subject to changing interpretation as times change and emergencies call for emergency interpretations of constitutional protections. And indeed, no constitutional protection of any kind is entirely absolute. And, and goes this argument, the Supreme Court has, while um, striking down pension changes, explicitly said, that doesn't mean there are no police power circumstances where it would be acceptable to make such changes, just that test wasn't met in this particular instance, that being the Felt case. Um, so basically this argument says, look, emergency situations allow unusual actions. We're experiencing an emergency, and in order to preserve other key public priorities, some of which may indeed be constitutionally protected in their own right, it's necessary to engage in some kind of balancing act wherein something that ordinarily might be construed as an impairment uh, of the contract or a diminishment of the pension itself would in fact be allowable. So those are the four arguments that I've heard uh, made. And, and I wanna focus on the last one. Um, why do I wanna do that? Well, first of all, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer. I'd, it's going to allow me to say things that lawyers, people who aren't lawyers might be qualified to say, which will be, will make me feel less uncomfortable up here and probably be a better use of your time. Um, but I also find it the most, well, let's back up for a split second. Here we are at the American Constitutional Society. We're all, um, I think by virtue of being here, interested in a progressive vision uh, certainly at least for uh, construction and application of the law, but I would guess 
most of us are interested in the application of a progressive vision of government's roles and responsibilities and functions. Certainly that is what brought me from being a math professor into seeking public office. And so to me, the argument that actually makes sense, not as a sort of legalistic dodge, but as a true statement of actual public priorities, is that we as a state are in really, really, really deeply severe trouble. And while Professor Lucine said something that 99 times out of 100 I totally agree with, which is that, hey, the legislators never want to get real with their constituents and make people sacrifice a little bit, which is a, a very, very, very apt uh, indictment of the way our political discourse and our electoral process tends to work in America. That notwithstanding, actually, if we read the recent history in Illinois, very, very, very serious sacrifice has been asked of recipients of almost all other state services, as well as, of course, those who pay income tax. And it leaves us, nonetheless, in a very, very, very troubled position, a position famously of being, having the worst credit rating of any state in the country, having an enormously high uh, share of debt to our gross state product as compared with other states, a high share of debt, a high number of, a high amount of debt as a share of our general revenue fund or our total state public sector spending. As compared with other states, we have the highest uh, pension debt by almost any metric that you'd like to, you could use of any state. Um, and we're doing, doing this in an environment when we're really quite egregiously underfunding education, underfunding human services, and um, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll be kind in my language, underfunding infrastructure and, and higher education and research, all of which to me are pointing to a public sector that is essentially uh, given up on the responsibilities of making the expenditures, or if you want to be a politician, investments that are required to build a long-term prosperous and equitable society. And so as I look at our budget picture and, and see what's, uh, what's evolved as essentially um, an enormous amount of pain that will have to be distributed by definition in one of three places, new tax revenue, um, cuts from spending outside of the area of public sector pensions, and then on the last leg of this stool, changes to the pension formulas themselves. And when I try to solve the pension problem by distributing that pain only among those first two stools, I can't get to a spot where we're doing what we need to do in the areas, the forward-looking areas of education, research, higher ed, infrastructure, that I think is required to build the kind of society that, if I may, we as progressives would demand government to play a key role in building. And that, that is what has brought me as an ethical matter to feeling that there's something very deeply unfair about making changes to a pension, a set of pension formulas that someone was promised, whether they were hired yesterday or 40 years ago. It's certainly worse if they were hired 40 years ago, but I think it's, it's unethical. It's, it's, it's unfair if they were hired yesterday as well. But when, when analyzing the different ways to deal with the problem we're facing, it seems to me that the most equitable distribution of the pain relies upon some reliance on changes to the pension formulas in order to get us through this while still doing what I think a state must do and what I think it could be argued a state, our state constitutionally has directed itself to do. And, and that's, the, that's the equity argument, the, if you could say such a terrible thing, the ethical argument and therefore the legal argument that I find myself uh, most moved by in answering the question of what the state may do or at least may contemplate doing vis-a-vis -vis pensions. So that, that, was, that was sort of a, um, um, I kind of like, like slid into second there. It was, there wasn't a clear demarcation between topics one and two in my table of contents, but now comes topic three. There you have it, clearly demarcated. Um, so what's happening in Springfield? Um, as Professor Lucine mentioned, uh, one of the most persuasive uh, and eloquent advocates of the view that the pension 
even in this current climate, must be treated as a contractual benefit and therefore can only be modified using the principles of contract law is the Senate President, John Collerton, and aided by the, the rather, uh, rather extraordinary uh, and, and, and scholarly work that he's done on the topic that, that she alluded to. His name is Eric Medeir. So the Senate President has, has advocated um, a mechanism for dealing with this problem that uh, relies upon um, two statements. The first statement is that uh, the right to uh, post-employment health care, in other words, retiree health care, is not a part of a retirement system in the sense protected by Article 13, Section 5, but instead it's entirely a gratuity um, as Professor Lucine indicated, pensions were prior to the adoption of Article 13, Section 5, and therefore it can be taken away. And his second statement is that um, while one of the inputs into the pension formula is final average salary, uh, nonetheless, uh, employees do not have a right to have future raises count toward that final average salary. It is, it is legal for the employer to offer future raises only on the condition that they not count toward the salary. And this, these two statements enable him to devise a plan that is, in, contains a trade that says we may deny you right to participate in retiree health care and deny your uh, right to have future raises count toward your pension calculation. But if we, if you don't want us, if you, um, we can just do that unilaterally. And so you have a choice. You can either accept that or else you can tell us not to do that. But by telling us not to do that, you have to voluntarily accept some very significant pension changes. So you're essentially offering everyone a choice. You're offering everyone consideration in exchange for which they may, uh, may accept a revised contract. And um, everyone winds up effectively either, either giving up retiree health care and having their future raises go toward their pension or else giving up substantially on the pension formula itself. So that was his proposal. Um, others, uh, including myself, have, have advanced other proposals. Um, that rely essentially on this emergency argument that the state, in order to protect the public interest, has no choice but to make some pension adjustments. Uh, so that, there is a bill that operates on that second uh, set of theories, making its way through the Senate and the House, that actually those two bills both passed out of committees last week. On the, the, my, so to speak, bill came out of the Senate Executive Committee on Wednesday, and the companion bill came out of the House Pension Committee on Thursday. And the Senate President has made a, a really interesting um, compromise, an attempt to, to really resolve the matter in a way that's, that gives real deference to all the different constitutional arguments. And in so doing, he's designed a bill that has two parts. And the bill has instructions to the courts written into it. It says, if the bill becomes law, part A is the law. And you should rule on part A because that's the law. But by the way, if you deem part A to be unconstitutional, there's a part B waiting in the wings for you to, for instance, rule on and, and so forth. So part A is not too far from the bill that, that, I'm, uh, that I've been working on that takes as its position that by a, there's an emergency justification for pension change. And then part B is this health care consideration model. And that bill also came out of the Senate Executive Committee on Wednesday. So right now we have three comprehensive pension bills that have gone, come out of committee, two in the Senate, one with two parts and one with one part, and one in the House, which is a one-part bill similar to the one-part Senate bill. And then additionally, <laughs> eek, um, the House has been engaging in a very long series of um, Um, well, they've been, they're votes, how about that? Let me use the noun and not the adjective. Uh, they've been engaging in a long series of votes on narrow pension bills. Um, they're voting on specific components 
of various of the proposals. And the idea, I believe, is that the speaker wants to put a lot of bills up on the board to have a lot of recorded votes to help illuminate the question of what members are prepared to support uh, because the lesson of the last few years is that it's extraordinarily easy not to pass a pension reform bill, but it is either very difficult or impossible to pass a pension reform bill. And I believe his view is that by putting all of these different bills up for public votes, there will be, that will be an indication of what the membership are, are prepared to support. So I think they've had nine or so of these bills so far, and two have passed, and seven have not, and I, my understanding is that there's likely to be more of this uh, process continuing, and perhaps out of that will come uh, gradually, might, gradually it might become more visible what the, what the actual rank and file members of the legislature are really able to, to get behind. So then of course it'll all have to get, you know, Frankenstein together. No, it's th that's, that's a literary error. It's not Frankenstein, it's Frankenstein's monsters together. Um, and that, of course, will create its own set of political difficulties. So that, I think, is where we are. It's a very, very, very volatile, uh, hard to read spot. But I th think the existence of so much activity is a reflection of the universal sense that something needs to be done. I'm afraid there's probably a political sense that something needs to be done, but, but there also, I, I hope, is a budgetary and policy recognition that the status quo wherein the pension payments just take a giant mallet to the rest of the budget every year and force us to every year do something that the previous year we had declared unthinkable uh, can't go on for too long either. So that, that's enough of me. And I think it's uh, Larry's turn. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I happen to represent the same constituency that Daniel does in my county board district and his Senate district. And uh, it's remarkable that someone who was a freshman in the House last year and a freshman in the Senate this year is the leader of one of the movements here. And I I'd really admire uh, Daniel taking this on. Um, Rod Bogoyevich, it's always good to start off with Rod Bogoyevich because we, we get better from there. Uh, uh, when he was governor, had a bill that was presented to him on uh, uh, the Telecommunications Act. And he, he signed it about 12 hours after the General Assembly passed it. When asked if he had any concerns about the constitutionality of it, he said, the great thing about being governor is you don't have to worry about the constitutionality. Uh, that bill, uh, 24 hours later, Judge Kokoris enjoined and uh, was declared unconstitutional after a short hearing a few days later. Um, one, one of the things we're going through in Illinois is a constitutional crisis. Um, and part of that crisis is trying to understand the separation of powers. Um, we have in this new General Assembly 177 members of the General Assembly, only 38 of them are lawyers. And I want you, as, as people who study the Constitution or are concerned about it, think about the implication of that. that. That means the vast majority of people are well-intended, dedicated public servants who've taken an oath of office to uphold the Constitution of the state of Illinois and the Constitution of the United States, but are, are trying to figure out how you do that in, in a political process. When we go to court, the judges we appear in front of are taking an oath to be fair and impartial. Members in a political process, the legislative branch of government, can be biased and partial, okay? And uh, this becomes very, very difficult to do. And, and what's happened is that there are all kind of parts of the Constitution that really come into play. It's not just the pension article. Um, the judicial article is playing an important role. I, in my little conversation with Ann, uh, in a number of the bills, the judges' pensions have been excluded. And the reason they've been excluded is because there's a separate provision about diminishing the compensation of judges, and uh, the concern is that that will be expanded based upon case law to include diminishing their pensions. And so the thought was not to put them in, though 
now in uh, both Senate Bill 1, Senate Bill 35, and the other, the judges are in there. Am I right? Or, no, they're not in there. They keep maybe getting in, maybe not getting in. So the judicial article is clearly at play here. Also, the fact that we don't have merit selection becomes an, an important uh, consideration here because while you need 60 votes to pass a bill in the House and 30 votes to pass a bill in the Senate, Speaker Madigan said to a group of people the other day, this all comes down to who can get four votes on the Illinois Supreme Court because four votes will determine what is constitutional and what, what, what can be done. The revenue article uh, is in, definitely involved here. Our inability to have a progressive income tax makes the fifth largest state in the union one of the slowest in recovering from 9-11 uh, and, and the recession because without a progressive income tax, we slowly come back. And part of it is our revenues, while they've gone up a little, aren't keeping pace with California or New York, states that uh, have progressive income taxes. And because our revenues aren't keeping pace, it's not just the money we owe the pension fund, but we're at about $9 billion behind in the day-to-day -day expenses of this state. The educational article of the Constitution is implicated here. The, the Constitution says that the state shall be primarily responsible for funding public education. The Illinois Supreme Court in 1991 said primarily did not mean the majority. We are now either 49th or 50th in state funding of public education, which has implications throughout this entire state and which is now having implications at the higher ed uh, issues, and we need to look at that. And then we have the pension article. Now, the bills that Daniel talked about are dealing with the five state pension funds minus the judges, so it's the four state pension funds. But as Speaker Madigan will tell you, one of those state pension funds, TRS, doesn't have any state employees in it because they're all the teachers in what they call the downstate and the suburban areas, in every place but Chicago are the teachers in the TRS fund. We have local governments that have problems. Mayor Emanuel has gone to Springfield and suggested that uh, we should have a 10-year freeze on COLAs. Uh, he wants that for all the city pension funds, and that's a laborer's fund, that's a police fund, a fire fund. Uh, he would hope that that would happen for the Chicago teachers. Uh, so we have a lot of different things that are, are in play. Now the, the question we were asked today is, who's going to pay? Well, there's only two people who can pay, the public and the employees. And the question is, how do you put together a bill that can deal with uh, a fair distribution between the public and the employees on, on the uh, payment? Now, I, I usually say that when you're dealing with the legislative, any legislative body, there are three things that you're trying to do. As an, one is you're educating people, and I think we've had a lot of folks who have done a good job in trying to educate as to what the pension system is in Illinois and where the problems are. Just look at yesterday's Sun-Times. They showed how, from Jim, Jim Edgar on, all of the mistakes that were made. Uh, I think you can go back even further to 1978 when Jim Thompson proposed for the first time a novel concept called a pension holiday. Now a pension holiday was not Anne Lucine going to, to Italy. It was we just don't make the payment as the employer. Remember, who's not making the payment? It's the employer. If this were your employer not making your Social Security contributions, it would be a crime. If it was your employer in an ERISA system not making the contributions, it would be a crime. We are now actually in all these hearings having lawyers who have done detailed briefs prepared for the Supreme Court of Illinois, not necessarily for the Illinois General Assembly, but that's where the, the arguments are going. Eric Medeer's paper, which I would recommend to you, is, is a very thoughtful paper, and he believes that consideration, he believes that under the Illinois Constitution that the, the, the key word in the uh, pension clause is enforceable contractual relationship and that therefore you figure out how do you modify a contract. Uh, and he, he goes into great detail in what is the first part of Senate Bill 1 and what Senator Cullerton uh, ha has been uh, proposing. Uh, we have briefs that have been written 
uh, by the major law firms. I think there may have been a reference to these. Mayor Brown, Sidley and Austin, and Jenner and Block have all written uh, one set of briefs that has been countered by Judge DeVito and Abner Mikva uh, as not interpreting the Illinois Constitution correctly. And all of a sudden, on the web pages of our political leaders, the people who are supposed to be biased and, and, and partisan, we've got legal briefs, and everybody's now got a strong opinion. Uh, and it's causing us to not be able to get anything done. I, I think that um, uh, we need to look at all of these sections of our Constitution, but it's not going to happen in time. Amending the Illinois Constitution is impossible. It's impossible. You, you can only by referendum amend what article? The legislative article. By referendum, it's only been amended once. Pat Quinn and his reduction in the size of the House in 1982. Other amendments that have been proposed have to come from the General Assembly. Well, the General Assembly is a political process. There was some reference by uh, Ann Lucen to the um, constitutional amendment that was defeated last November. Now, it didn't repeal the pension clause. What it did is it was creating a rather difficult three-fifths vote to get any increase in pension benefits going forward. And it was so poorly worded that nobody was quite sure what it applied to. Does it apply to the pension board? Did it apply to all the local governments? Did it apply to the General Assembly? And it was narrowly defeated because I think it was just confusing. But I think that part of the reason that amendment was on the ballot is that certain political leaders wanted to be able to have candidates who were running for office last November say, well, I supported a constitutional amendment that can help the pension issue. But it did nothing in terms of dealing with the, the funding or, or the benefits. Um, yesterday, or today, the Chicago Tribune, in their editorial, after saying that Daniel is one of the brightest and the best members of the General Assembly, then all of a sudden, in bold print, they say one caveat on the BIS bill. It includes unfortunate language that would put the state on the hook for regular payments into the pension funds as a contractual obligation. That's a worthy commitment, but also one stronger and more enforceable than the ones that are now in state law. Yeah, that was the whole idea. But they suggest, oh, you, here's these people who want us to solve the problem. Now I said, but don't go too far. Don't give those employees rights that are enforceable against the state. And I, I think that my hope is that the members of the General Assembly will try to come together and realize that they are an independent branch of government, that they've got to give this the best shot they can to pass something that goes to the Illinois Supreme Court. Um, but at this point, I would say that none of the bills, and Daniel can tell you his, his feeling, none of the bills is anywhere near passage in terms of support for the bills. Um, if we don't resolve this pension issue, that $9 billion grows to $10 billion next year. We, all of these funds will be extremely weak. We can hope that the stock market can help carry them, but it's not going to come back enough to carry it. And we can never overcome all the pension holidays that were given in, from 1978 on. And if Daniel and his fellow members can resolve the issue for the state funds and get a reading from the Supreme Court, then maybe people like me who serve at local government funds will have a chance to see some changes that would benefit us. Now, I'm happy to tell you that Cook County has the best funded pension fund of any of the governments in Illinois. The only fund that is actually better than us is a multi-government fund that is uh, the uh, municipal fund for all of the communities outside of Chicago. And part of the reason they're so strong is, one, they've had a very disciplined investment strategy, and two, they've not let any of the municipalities making payments get a holiday. They've made all of their payments. It's uh, the M MR IMRF. IMRF, right? IMRF. Um, but our fund, as a sole government in Cook County, is probably the best funded, and we've never missed a pension payment, never took a holiday. Uh, and I think uh, we now are looking at a lot of factors that maybe fit into either the Cullerton uh, analysis or the BIS analysis. And I, 
they, they are different approaches. One of the things that, uh, in the Cullerton analysis, there are two things. Daniel said, it's your increase in income. But secondly, it is, how do you deal with retiree health care? And retiree health care is not part of the pension. So it's not covered by the pension clause. And so the, the Cullerton proposal is that if you make a deal contractually, we guarantee you retirement health care. The problem is he doesn't guarantee what it is. It could be an aspirin and a Band-Aid every other month. I mean, all, and John will tell you this, that it, all it does is say you have a right to a benefit, but it doesn't describe what that benefit is. Um, I, I think that um, the suggestions of various ways of taxing and suggestion on retirees, I hear that from a lot of public employees who have got really nice pensions who say, I wouldn't mind being taxed. Uh, people who want to do the Robin Hood tax, who knows what the Robin Hood tax is? That's taxing the Chicago, what Daniel does, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and on all of its transactions. Uh, and forget that they threaten to move across the line to Indiana and have the computer do those transactions in Hammond instead of in Chicago. Um, everybody has a theory, but nobody's willing to put skin in the game. And so again, I want to end by saying, I'm very proud to share a constituency with Daniel and, and the fact that he's willing to put forth a proposal and willing to take the brunt of the criticism from lawyers and non-lawyers, from mathematicians and non-mathematicians. We, we have a PhD in physics who's in the house and he is, uh, I'd say, 80% supportive of, of your proposal, uh, uh, but 20% he's a little awkward on. But uh, w one day, Daniel and, and, and Representative Fortner, who, who's on the, uh, uh, he, he's at Argonne, right? Or Fer Fermi, uh, went to our Math and Science Academy to talk to the kids that are there, and these, these young kids were all deceived. They thought that every member of the General Assembly had a PhD in a science. Uh, it's not true, and, and so trying to figure out how you put this together is very difficult. I think with that, Daniel, why don't you come up here and we'll, we'll both take questions. Um, I think if we were to um, teleport the 177 members of the General Assembly into the Senate and House chambers right now and call for votes, we couldn't pass a bill that would get the job done. Um, I have, I'm going to say one more sentence and turn it over to Larry um, because his experience is so much more significant than mine, and his, his reads of the currents, I think, are really, are really um, built on a, a very firm understanding of how the process works that I'm just trying to get my head around. But my sense of the, the tone in Springfield, and I would not have said this six weeks ago, is that something will be passed between now and May 31st. I, I think I, I agree with Daniel that something will pass between now and May 31st because people are afraid to go home. They're, I mean, they're being stopped in restaurants. They're being stopped on the street. The people who are stopping them are two groups of people. They're public employees who are very concerned about their futures, and there are other people who just read about this and feel embarrassed that they live in Illinois, and that's a, a new feeling for them. Uh, uh, Adlai Stevenson II, when he was our governor from 48 to 52, had an expression he used to use when he was in a difficult situation. He would say, thank God for New Jersey. It always makes Illinois look good. We can't say that in this pension crisis. Uh, and so I think something is going to pass. The legislative process, though, is very difficult because of going back to that 82 amendment where we went to single member districts. We lost a lot of independence and we have a lot of members of the General Assembly who are much more inclined to follow leadership. And leadership at this point is not giving clear signals. And so it's rare that Elaine Neckritz, who's a, another a person who I share some territory with, uh, and Daniel were able last year to put together their, their own bill, if you will, and then begin to get 
of people to, to come to it. Um, but we're going to see, I, I think you're right, we're going to see something. I don't know if it will include any of the local districts. It's going to be hard enough to deal with maybe taking TRS out, the three funds, that, that's the, the, the state university personnel, the members of the General Assembly, which is the most underfunded uh, uh, fund, and then the uh, uh, regular state employees fund. But uh, TRS and the judges will probably go to the side. Any other questions? Yes. Is the reason for taking the TRS out just the, um, the fact that the state now is making the employer's contributions and there's not enough political support to shift that back to the school districts? Well, I, I think that that's part of it. The cost shift has been a big issue. I mean, last week the Senate Republicans came out with a whole proposal saying that Chicago has been stealing money from the rest of the state to try to argue that the, the, the state paying the pension payments is not a problem, though it, it, you, you've been working on this uh, and spent a lot of time on it. Well, so I'll just say two things. Um, so does everyone know this cost shift issue? Okay. I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a few no's. So um, the, there are two entirely separate, though very similar, teacher pension systems in Illinois. The teacher's retirement system, sorry, let me do the, the other order. The Chicago Teacher's Pension Fund for all CPS teachers and the teacher's retirement system for everybody else. And they have the, the truly bizarre feature that the employer share for the Chicago fund is uh, essentially entirely paid for by CPS, the employer. And the employer share- Therefore, taxpayers in Chicago- That's right. Who give them money. That's right. It's paid out of pro the property tax bills in Chicago. The uh, employer share for TRS, the everybody else teacher pension fund, is paid for out of a general state appropriation. In other words, out of state's general revenue. In other words, out of people's income taxes, including, by the way, Chicago's income taxes, who are already paying in the, via their property tax for their own teachers' pensions. So this is a, obviously crazy. And whether and what it, regardless of what the correct fix is, nobody ever would have intentionally designed a system like this. So one of the proposals has been to shift the responsibility of making the employer payment to the actual employers, the school districts, which would uh, probably make good economic sense, at least as a matter of aligning responsibilities, while simultaneously saving the state some money. Uh, this has been very politically controversial because it's been characterized by those who oppose it as a property tax increase uh, because the school districts would now have additional, liability, additional obligations that one might argue, inaccurately I believe, that the only way they could ever meet them is by raising property taxes. Uh, so that that political controversy has led to a slowdown regarding the teacher's retirement system. But I think the biggest reason is just that, I don't mean to sound so crass, but everybody in the General Assembly has lots of teachers in their district. I mean, quite frankly, I hope I just do the right thing in all cases, but as a matter of politics, I can get away with really, effect, really offending state employees, because I don't represent that many of them. Uh, nobody feels politically that it's easy to upset teachers. And I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with colleagues where I say, here's a pension bill I'm advocating. What do you think? I think we really have to do it. I know it's painful, but here's why I think it's important and the right way forward. And they say, yeah, but the thing is, I represent a lot of teachers. Well, you know, we, we all do. They're distributed everywhere. And that makes the politics of the teacher system very different to the other systems. Now, I will just say quickly that the teacher's retirement system is the majority of the total debt for the state systems. We owe over, I think we owe about $53 billion on that one and only $96 billion total. So there is no solution that doesn't address TRS. You can argue about what it is. Is it just a cost shift, which is certainly constitutional? Is it a bunch of other stuff and a cost shift? Is it just the other stuff? Different conversation. But we certainly can't really get out of this without uh, some, some set of reforms of some nature or another that will affect TRS eventually. And just to give, give you an example, Daniel and I have been at two f community forums. We expected maybe 100 people at the first one. We had close to 300, and I would say 299 of them were retired uh, suburban teachers. Uh, and the second one was a forum of active teachers uh, in a high school auditorium. And after school, they came from everywhere. It was, it was just amazing how this huge auditorium, which, you know, filled up. And so 
this is a, an issue. They, they are a very vocal lobbying group. But at the end of the day, something has to go to the Illinois Supreme Court because this is not going to be totally resolved. Whatever they pass, this, this bill is going to be challenged and fast-tracked to, to the court. And we, we really probably need the Supreme Court to give some guidance uh, for how we're going to do the second bill because the first bill isn't going to be the final solution. Peter. Uh, on the legal issue, I think that uh, the Supreme Court's ruled on these issues of when, when do public employees benefit tax. It's not a risk, it's not five years later, it's not ten years later. It's when somebody enters the system. So most of the proposals that I've written in the legislature are going to require the Supreme Court to change the law, to change the interpretation of the Constitution, which means that those bills So there were many questions there, and I will talk for a while and doubtless fail to address some, and then you'll tell me which ones I failed to address, and then we'll try round two. Um, first of all, a technical correction. Uh, we are not changing our funding ratio by demanding 100% funding. We're not. The funding ratio is the value of the assets divided by the value of the liabilities. Now, if you were to choose to say, we're going to henceforth ignore the number, the value of the liabilities, that number doesn't matter anymore, and replace it in all instances that one would otherwise think about it with 80% of it, its value, then you could artificially juice your funding ratio. But to my knowledge, nobody proposes that. Many people do share your view that our goal shouldn't be 100% funding, but none of them say, pretend that 80% is 100%. So that's an important distinction and a, a really relevant one, I think. Um, let me start with a non-mathy point. Um, my view, and this is the view that I brings me to disagree with the Chicago Tribune today. This is the view that is informed by looking at IMRF. This is a view that I think is well supported by history is that by far the biggest set of mistakes that have ever been made associated with pension management in Illinois regard ignoring the actuaries. We've, other bad things have happened. Other mistakes have happened. That's not been the only cause of trouble. But by far the biggest trouble has been when we have intentionally ignored the actuaries. Now, the actuaries view 30 years as as far out as you should go. And there's a reason for that, and the reason is essentially the situation we're in now. If you, if you map out a 50-year, or as you were proposing, a 45-year funding plan, you leave yourselves open 
to an enormously long runway of uncertainty. And because you're pushing out so much of the payment so far into the future, uncertainty in the first 20 years of that 45-year runway could really leave you in a spot where the last 25 years are going to be extremely unpleasant. That's essentially the situation we're in today. There's a lot wrong with the 50-year ramp that we're currently on, besides simply the fact that it's 50 years long. But the fact that it's 50 years long is, is without question, a, a major source of trouble. So I, I think ignoring the actuaries is not good policy, given, given the history of what brought us to where we are today. Um, do we have to be 100% funded? No. So current law says 90% by 2045. 90% is OK. 80% is probably OK. Professor Lucine intimated that the actuarial profession widely agrees that 80% is OK. They don't, but some people think it's OK. The, the question, there's several questions. The first, qu the first question, <laughs> says the mathematician, trust this guy. Um, the first question is, what is a good status quo? Where do we want to eventually get to? Do we want to eventually live at 80% funding forever? Or would we rather, having gotten there, keep on moving up so that we eventually, eventually get to 100% funding? The answer, I believe, is clear. We want to get to 100% funding. And the reason for that is that if you live at 80% funding forever, you are paying interest. And that interest currently is, uh, because of the uh, discount rates used by the systems, 7.9%. You're paying interest on that remaining 20%. So today, our total liability is you know, to very, very ballpark at around $150 million. The billion. The bill. Whew. That was this wonderful yeah, moment. $150 million we could handle. <laughs> Did you? Sorry, I've, I'm, I'm, my, I'm in cloud nine. I don't know what happened. Um, $150 billion. So let's say we just said 80% funding is fine. That would mean 20% debt is fine. That's about $30 billion. Probably, I'm probably lowballing it slightly. but. $30 billion-ish. So $30 billion uh, at an 8% interest rate means that we're paying every year not too far from $2.5 billion just in debt service. So the question is, do we want to live a life where $2.5 billion, which itself constitutes uh, not too far from 8% of our general revenue fund, is just thrown into the pension fund to deal with debt? Or do we want to eventually somehow scratch and claw our way to 100% funding so that that's not our long-term plan? And I think the answer is clear. We want to get to 100% funding and not be spending nearly 10% of our revenue on pension debt. Does that mean it has to be 100% in 30 years? No. It could be 80% in 30 years, and then you do another ramp after that. And I'm, I'm open to it. But I have been amazed at how little a difference it makes, how small the impact on the annual payment of adjusting that within reasonable levels. If you dropped it down to 60%, you'd, be, you'd have a much easier payment to make. But then, of course, you, wouldn't, um, you would be exposing yourself to the same risk of just sort of going insolvent at some point. So, so that's, that's the one set of points. The last comment of yours I'd like to address is the, it's always been like this comment. And it is true that the funding ratio of the plan We've, we've gone up uh, either by investment fluctuations, which is another way of saying luck, or else by increased payments. Um, and certainly, you know it will fluctuate up and down and up and down with time. And so if you, if you accept 40% of your status quo, then the next time a financial crisis hits, you're going to be in truly severe trouble. But the other thing to say is that <clears throat> I want to be very careful how I, how I say this, because I, I don't, this isn't an, Language like this is used in a very anti-employee context by others. And I'm, I don't mean that. But understand that the systems were designed during a very different era of life expectancy. Now, what that means is that, is that the cost of these systems as a share of total compensation 
has steadily increased. And by the way, total covered payroll as a share of general revenue has steadily increased because of the fact that we pay the teacher's fund and the teacher payroll has grown much faster than the state government. And so those two realities together point to a 2013 very grim picture which we did not have 40 years ago because the entire size of the systems relative to the state's economy and relative to the state's budget was substantially smaller. So we were not paying back then essentially 20% of the state's general revenue into the pension fund just to meet statutory obligations. That's what we're doing today. More than that if you count debt service, a little bit less if you don't. And the current projection is that that is going to grow substantially. And, and I guess it, on some level the question is, and not grow substantially under the Daniel plan of 100% by 30 years from now, but under the statutory plan of 90% by 2045. And so the, the question on some level is just how much of general revenue can our democracy accept going toward the pension systems? At what point does that become an unworkable social contract? And I fear that we're not far from there. And that fear animates a lot of my activities in this area. How late are we supposed to go? Maybe one more question. OK. Do we, do we have a question back there? Yeah. yeah Jean, yes. So the, the real question here is <clears throat> all of us except for the Chicago Tribune editorial board and the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club and Bruce Browner agree that the state should pay its share. Whatever we're going to agree to be the required state payment, whatever we're going to agree to be the benefit, it's unethical, not to mention fiscally irresponsible, to make a long-term promise and fail to adequately set aside money to fund it. And then, of course, as you all know, the problem is that it's very, very difficult for a legislature to bind future legislatures. So the question is what would be, so the simplest answer is put in place a constitutional right, as exists, for instance, in New Hampshire. There's a constitutional direction. The Constitution of New Hampshire says, basically, the state uh, pension system shall certify a number, and the legislature shall appropriate it. And they do. So that would be one way of handling this. Um, I am massively skeptical as to whether the voting public of Illinois would go for something that's about guaranteeing more money toward pensions today. So if, I'm happy to support that, but I doubt we could make that happen. So the question then becomes, what else can you do to guarantee state funding? And I think an honest assessment has to recognize that any mechanism you try to put in statute brings with it the risk that it could be undone by an act of the legislature. But the, the mechanism that was brought to us by organized labor was to say that, it in, to, was to write in statute that as a part of the contractual relationship protected by Article 13, Section 5, the employee has a right to actually have the system make its payment. 
So then the question becomes, okay, now you write that right into statute in a manner that references the Constitution, maybe that helps, maybe not, but still, what relief is there? So in the bill that I uh, brought to committee last week, the relief was that the system itself may bring a suit, and the, the judge would then presumably have sort of a back and forth between actuaries, figure out if the state appropriated adequately, and if it did not, um, direct the state to uh, make a supplemental appropriation, essentially. Some back and forth took place in the committee last Wednesday, wherein the view was articulated that that is inadequate because for the system, if we're talking about a contractual right where the, the two parties to the contract are the state and the participant in the pension plan, the system itself is not one of the parties to the contract, so really no relief at all is being granted to the person holding the contract for a third party to be able to bring suit. So we actually have prepared an amendment that I, it may have just been filed, it may not, I'm not sure yet, which would say um, that this is not just a right of the systems, but it's a part of the system's fiduciary responsibilities, which I think is already what a fiduciary responsibility is. And moreover, we write into the statute that a participant in the pension plan may go to court to compel the system to exercise this right to go to court to compel the state to pay. Unquestionably, a convoluted set of events, and your concerns are legitimate, um, but I think there is a flip side to this, which is that we legislators <clears throat> are, we are not typically, we don't typically function like robots or mathematicians. We typically respond to pressures. And the specter of a very credible suit in court that would compel us subsequent to the passage of a budget to make a supplemental appropriation of, in practice, what would probably be billions of dollars into the pension fund, I expect would have a fairly substantial impact on our budget process. So for example, since I've been in the legislature, we actually have made our statutorily required pension payment out of general revenue off the top and, re and and subtracted that amount from our revenue projections in determining how much <clears throat> revenue is left to spend. All we really want is for that practice to never stop. And I think a very significant and messy uh, judicial hammer <clears throat> telling us not to stop behaving that way, even though I respect your concerns about how it would play out in practice if we ever got there, is itself a pretty powerful deterrent. Uh, Daniel mentioned that the uh, Illinois House has been having votes. The cynical side of people say that they're having these votes to try and get members to be on record for things that can be used in mailers against them in their next election. But I, on, on the practical side, they're, they're trying to figure out what pieces have support to try to put this together. And uh, I, I think that uh, if you look at the decision on Obamacare in the United States Supreme Court, there was one lawyer in the Justice Department's team who at the last minute said, why don't we throw the tax question into our brief? And without that, Justice Roberts would not have decided the, the case the way he did. So you, you're never quite sure what's going to work in this process. And for constitutional lawyers, this is, a, in my mind, a constitutional dilemma because all of these parts of our Constitution are in play. We don't have the ability to amend them, and we don't have the ability to change how the Supreme Court's case law is going to be up to this point, but they may change their mind. And that's why when Speaker Madigan says it's the group that's got four votes, that, that's the group that's going to win this discussion. And I don't know who's got four votes right now, because we don't have any idea what's going to get there. So I, I, I want to thank you all, and, and I, I'm thank really you. always grateful to be with Daniel in a public setting.